Parasparam Jigisantha Apachakra Tur Atmanaha Utapanai With lifting up U Unayanai Caring Chalanai Pushing away Stapanai Holding stationary Api also, also. Parasparam, Parasparam, each other, each other. Jigi Santao, wanting victory, victory. Apachakratuhu, <laughs> they harmed <laughs> Atmana, Atmana, even themselves. Forcefully lifting and carrying each other, pushing each other away and holding each other down. The fighters hurt even their own bodies in their great eagerness for victory. Purport. Srila Jiva Goswami explains that although Krishna and Balaram did not, of course, harm themselves, it appeared that way to Chanura, Mustika, and others of mundane vision. In other words, the lords were fully absorbed in the pastime of being wrestlers. We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 44, entitled The Killing of Kamsa. Text number five. Yesterday, we were discussing Krishna's entrance into Mathura.
especially how he showered his grace upon Trivakra or Kubja, a story that gives us great instruction and hope. Because like Kupja, we are all inherently perfect, being part of Krishna. Our glory is our connection to Krishna. Because Krishna is supremely perfect. Our perfection is not something that we should be proud that just see how perfect I am. Because in material existence, this conception of understanding one's own greatness either creates arrogance toward those who are not so great or makes us depressed that someone may even be greater. But when we understand what true greatness is, janmatya sayataha. This is the first aphorism of the Vedanta Sutra. Vedanta Sutra, Srila Vyasadev, after writing four Vedas, or compiling Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Atarva Veda, expanding upon them through Upanishads, Agamas, Puranas, Mahabharat. He compiled the Vedanta Sutra in very short sutras, very, very concise verses he explained the essence of all knowledge and begins with Jan Madhya Shalyata, that everything emanates from the absolute truth. Nothing could be separate from the absolute truth. The only separation possible is our forgetfulness of the inherent connection we have with the absolute truth. That is Maya. Maya, Srila Prabhupada translate as that which is not. Because no one can ever be separated from Krishna. But when we think we're separate, when we forget that relationship, it's just not appreciating the only reality. And that is the cause of all problems and suffering. So being part of Krishna, to the extent we understand Krishna, to, the, to that extent we understand our own value. Krishna is infinite, ever increasing in every aspect of his perfection. His beauty is the source of all beauty. It's the fullness, the accumulation of all beauty. And at the same time, it's beyond. It's ever increasing. As is his character, his love, is happiness. And because every living being is a part of Krishna, the more we understand Krishna, the more we understand our love for Krishna. And how could there be arrogance? Because we see that every living being is also an equal part of the perfection of Krishna. So in bhakti, in spiritual realization, the greater we understand we are being part of Krishna, the also the greater we can appreciate 
everyone is being part of Krishna. But somehow or other, due to the selfish egoism, it makes us the weight, just like Kupja was a hunchback. And the weight of her back made her whole body crooked. So from an analogy perspective, the weight of our ahankar, our ego, tends to make us very crooked. Crooked means we want to exploit others. We want to claim the property of God to be our own. We want to be the enjoyer. We want to be the proprietor. We want to be the lord of all we survey. Greed, envy, anger, selfish passion, illusion. This makes us crooked. And because of the weight of our previous conditionings, living such a crooked life, the weight of our samskaras and our karmas and our attachments and our illusions are so heavy. Only by Krishna's grace can we, became, can we become st straight, whole, and again in our natural, beautiful, spiritual condition. Krishna tells in Gita, this grace is only attainable through bhakti, through devotional service. Kubja rendered service. She, she was attracted by Krishna and she, she was willing to even risk her life to please Krishna. Kamsa represents that envy and that materialistic arrogance and greed. And it was by the influence of Kamsa that she was thinking that whatever she had was for his satisfaction. In a similar way, we are all serving this Kamsa energy that is within and without. This selfishness, this arrogance. But with the same thing she was all about to offer to Kamsa, she decided, I want to give this to Krishna. Similarly, with the same bodies, with the same minds, with the same facilities, if we just offer them with devo devotional service for the pleasure of Krishna, then we attract Krishna. So Kupja just offered some service. She performed bhakti. And the result is she attained Krishna's grace. And Krishna lifted her up, made her straight, made her in her natural condition. And in that natural condition, her love for Krishna awakened forever. She realized her constitutional position. And within, by, by the inconceivable grace of the Lord, from just being kind of a rejected person, she developed a mood very much like the gopis. She became Krishna's lover, and Krishna became her lover. So as the story goes on, in today's verse, Janura and Mustika, these two powerful wrestlers, have challenged Krishna. This was Kamsa's arrangement. Kamsa wanted, 
Kamsa considered Krishna a competitor, a threat. Because on the day of Vasudeva and Devaki's marriage, Kamsa, who was so affectionate to his sister Devaki, decided, I will personally come off my throne and drive you on your chariot to your new home. Then a celestial voice resounded in the sky, warning Kamsa that the eighth son of Devaki will be the cause of his death. Now he became so much afraid. He was considered so fearless, but he was so afraid. He had so many powers, supernatural powers. He could conquer practically anyone in the universe. Each of his hands and arms had far more strength than 10,000 gigantic elephants. Can you imagine? And they kind of just looked like regular arms. <laughs> it's not that his arms were like, looked like 10,000 elephants. <laughs> but that was the power within them. And he actually subjugated all of the different asuras and all different planets. But no material acquisition of wealth, strength, fame, beauty, nothing in this world can free us from fear. And you can't really be happy when you're in fear. Fear that something that is undesirable is imminent in our life. Abrama bhuvanar loka punar avatanojana. Krishna tells that from the highest planet in this material world down to the lowest, all are places where everyone has to suffer. Because death is for sure. Death is absolutely certain for the physical body. The only thing that's somewhat uncertain is when exactly it's going to happen. And this when is a very um, disturbing conception because it could actually then padam padam yadvi padam datesha could actually happen to anyone at any moment. Whoever we are. So this is a fearful situation. And Kamsa was given a nice warning. Now Shukadev Goswami is describing this story to Parikshit Maharaj. Parikshit Maharaj was given the warning that he was going to die in seven days. But he had no fear at all. In fact, he was happy. He took this as a wonderful blessing, an opportunity. But just see, he's a king. Kamsa wasn't even yet the king. He usurped the, the kingdom afterward. He was a crown prince. Pariksit Maharaj was the king. And when he was told he was going to die in seven days, he accepted, this is Krishna's grace. My soul's eternal. But whatever little time we have in this human life, we can utilize to realize the eternal blissful nature of the soul in our relationship with Krishna, with God. Maharaj Katvanga one of the great historical personalities, Parikshit Maharaj, referred to Mahajano Yenagatasapanta. We refer to the great souls of the history. Maharaj Katvanga was told after he did so much service for the demigods, 
he literally gave up sleeping for years to fight on their behalf. And he did so well. He actually protected the devatas. And after all that, you, it, it's hard work. Usually if you really work hard like that, you're expecting some, some happiness in return, some blessing. So the devas said, well, what blessing would you like? Well, we could give you anything. He said, I just want to know when I'm going to die. They checked the records, the karmic celestial records. They said, you are going to die in one moment. Now, Maharaj Kutvanga could have said, you know, I could have spent those years um, enjoying <laughs> the last year. I, I spent all those years in so much pressure and stress fighting for you, and what am I going to get for it? I'm going to die now before I can even enjoy the fruits of it? But he didn't think like that because he was raised to understand the true value of life. So he took it as a blessing. So nice, I know when I'm going to die. Antakale chamame smaran bhaktva kalevaram. Krishna tells, if you just remember me at the time of death, you come to me. So he remembered Krishna. And in a moment he went back home, back to God. He was happy. So Parikshan Maharaj had seven days. Let me go to the bank of the Ganga, the Ganges, to be among the great saints of the world. Vyasdev, Narada, Parasara, Bhardraj Muni, all of these great saints, Vishwamitra, Vashishta, they all came to be with the king. What a wonderful thing. Seven days and their association is worth millions of lifetimes just trying to make ends meet in this world. And he only prayed for one benediction from all of them. Just let me be absorbed in hearing and chanting the glories of my Lord. So that's Parikshit. He had no fear because he understood the purpose of life. And here's Kamsa. Eighth son, that means he had minimum eight years to live. <laughs> hmm? Because, you know, you can't, you know, it may be nine months of pregnancy and all that, and then a baby's born, and it's not that the next day you have another baby. <laughs> so minimum he had eight years. Yes? But he was so afraid. Pariksit had seven days, no fear. Kamsa, immediately he put his, his sister and his brother-in-law in prison and shackled them and started, he was afraid that any one of their children may be this eighth child, even though it's supposed to be the eighth child, and he was killing every one of them upon birth. And then when the eighth child was born, you know, he thought it was this little girl, he was about to kill her, and the little girl went in the sky and said, Oh, Kamsa, you are so foolish. <laughs> Krishna knows how to really um, straighten you out. The thing is, when Krishna went to straighten out Kubra, she just surrendered. Whatever you want, Krishna. So when he just put his feet on her feet and with his two little fingers, he pulled her up by the chin, she was just like surrendered. She went up. She wasn't trying to hold on to the position she was in. She, Sharana, Sharanagati, she, she took shelter. She gave herself. Krishna, whatever you like, I am yours. But Kamsa was all fearful. Even though he stole the kingdom away from his own father and put his father in prison, put his sister and brother in prison, anyone who wasn't totally um, 
um, surrender to anything he said. He either killed them or drove them out. And most of the Yadu dynasty, Andaka dynasty, Boja dynasty, most of them just fled to secret places and hid because they didn't want to be under the, the dictatorship of Kamsa. But Kamsa was afraid. Real strength is to rise above this fear. And we can only rise above the fear in a real way when we totally humble, humble ourselves before God, before Krishna. You can't be arrogant and fearless. Because arrogance means you're holding on to your own separate egoistic identity. And before people in this world who we may be able to conquer to some extent, Kamsa had no, he had no competitor in this world. The demigods, they had to approach Vishnu and say, please help us with this Kamsa, we can't do it. So powerful. But yet, when a warning came, he lived in such fear because death is inevitable for everyone unless we identify with our eternal soul then we become transcendental Kamsa sent so many Asuras demons to Vrindava and Krishna delivered every one of them then he invited Krishna to come to Mathura where he was going to see him for the first time, face to face. And he had all these arrangements. He had his entire military ready to fight Krishna. He had Kuvalaya Pita, this massive elephant that was stronger than thousands of elephants. And then ultimately he had Chanura and Mushtika, the two wrestlers. And he was sitting on his throne, not only with his armies, but with his own mighty arms and his sword and all of his weapons, ready to kill Krishna if nothing else worked. He really planned everything very strategically. He was an incredible manager, incredible organizer. But it was all for the wrong reasons. And Krishna sees our purpose. He just doesn't see how good we are at something. He sees the purpose in which we're doing it. So Chanura and Mustaka saw little Krishna and Balaram. Everyone was seeing them in different ways, according to their nature. And Chanura and Mustika, even though Krishna, the, the ladies of Mathura were seeing his limbs as being so beautiful and so tender, they were actually seeing him as very, very powerful adversaries and challenged them to fight for the pleasure of Kamsa. And in today's verse, they're in the middle of the fight. And Krishna and Balaram are making things so exciting. Just to draw the ecstasies of love from the hearts of different people. And to draw whatever responses according to a person's particular state of consciousness for all time to come. When we become absorbed in hearing Shravanam, we can actually experience exactly the same emotions and the same reciprocation with Krishna as the people of Mathura when they were watching the fight. In the coming verses, the ladies of Mathura When they were seeing this, they were in 
so much distress because Krishna's charm, his smiles, his beauty, his, his lovingness really enchanted their hearts. They fell in love with Krishna just by seeing him. And the nature of their love was they were severely worried about Krishna. And they began to speak among themselves with quite loud voices. They were exclaiming, alas, what a greatly irre irreligious act the members of this royal assembly are committing as the king watches this fight between the strong and the weak, they also want to see it. You see, these, these women, they consider the match totally unfair. Chanura and Mustika, their limbs were like lightning bolts and their bodies were like gigantic mountains. They were so fast and they were trained with such strength to kill, to destroy, to crush human bodies or anything else that came before them. And, for, and they're seeing Chanura Mushtaka and then they're looking at little Krishna and Balaram. They were a fraction of their size. Krishna and Balaram appeared in their Kishore Lila. When they came to Mathura, they were both 11 years old. To be specific, they were 10 years and 7 months old when they came. And Chanura Mushtika were at the prime of their adulthood. They were grown. Krishna's, Balaram's limbs looked so soft. They didn't, have, they didn't have big muscles or anything like that. Their limbs were like lotus petals. How unfair this is. And then they're fighting with each other. And as they're fighting, they're seeing that Krishna and Balaram they have perspiration on their faces. They compare their perspiration to the dew on a lotus flower. Now Krishna's perspiring and that perspiration is invoking so much anxiety in the women. Because they, they're interpreting the perspiration is how much Krishna and Balaram are struggling and straining against these giant wrestlers. It's unfair. It's irreligious. We shouldn't even be here. According to the laws of the scriptures, according to the teachings of the saints, if one enters into an assembly where irreligious activities are being performed, one should either not go in, or one should immediately leave, or one should speak up to protest. But if one just sits silently out of fear and allows all these irreligious things to go on, then one becomes implicated in the sinful reactions. So what are we doing here? How could we tolerate this? Kamsa, our king, he is so sinful. He's, he's inviting this, he's organizing this, and he's watching this. But what about all the rest of the innocent citizens? They're watching just like their king. Krishna tells in Gita that what great people do, what leaders do, the common people follow. And they're saying, we're off. We're all doing what Kams is doing. This is sinful. This is terrible. It's not fair. These beautiful, young, tender boys being put in a match with these killers. 
And then the, the ladies naturally were thinking of Brindavan. How fortunate are the people of Brindavan? Because there, all the bridge bossies, they don't come to see Krishna in this situation. They spent their lives seeing Krishna playing his flute, dancing with his devotees, giving pleasure to his cows. What a wonderful place Brindavan is, where everyone was taking pleasure seeing Krishna enjoying with Balaram, with his devotees. But what a, what a wretched place, what a condemned place Mathura is, where everyone's assembled to see Krishna fighting against these monsters. And the ladies began to meditate and talk among themselves about the, the supreme good fortune of the gopis of Vrindavan. What type of austerities the gopis must have performed? Where they were seeing Krishna in such a loving mood of happiness in the forest, garlanded with beautiful flowers. And gopis, remembering these loving pastimes of Krishna, whether they were milking cows, or whether they were churning butter, or whether they were making cow dung patties, or whether they were harvesting wheat or grinding grains, or whether they were just cleaning their homes. Whatever they did, the gopis were constantly in meditating on the beautiful, loving pastimes of Krishna. Always singing about Krishna. Always talking about Krishna. And this is what we have to see. Our first vision of Krishna is in this condition. They were asking what type of austerities did the gopis do? Because they also wanted to have the love of the gopis and the opportunity of the gopis. But it's not by austerities. They were remembering even goddess Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. In Bhailvan or Srivan, she performed long years of tapasya, austerities in order to enter into the loving pastimes of the gopis with Krishna. But even such an exalted personality could not enter unless one follows in the footsteps of the gopis with all humility, unless one gets the grace of Sri Rata and the gopis. There's no other way. And this is bhakti. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give what even Lakshmi was longing for to everyone and anyone who just accepts it in this age of Kali. This is the, a very, very special blessing that through Srila Prabhupada and our Guru Parampara, we've all been given. The Srimad Bhagavatam tells us, Savai pung sang paro dharma yato bhakti radhoksha jaya hoite ki aprati hata yayatma suprasidati. That the supreme perfection of all dharma is the awakening of pure love of God from the heart. Unmotivated, uninterrupted loving service to the Supreme Lord. This is the goal, the essence of every religion. And it is recognized and, and adored 
wherever we may see it. But at the same time, the nature of the gopi's love is so inclusive, so intimate, so profound. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he has come to give us entrance into this love. Namo Mahabharata Nyaya Krishna Prem Pradayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namane Gaudat Vaishnava. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is so magnanimous, even more magnanimous than Krishna himself, even though he is Krishna himself. How can Krishna be more magnanimous than Krishna? <laughs> Krishna is Swarat. He's independent. He can do anything he likes. He can be, he can be more magnanimous than himself, and he cannot be more magnanimous than himself. He can make, be less magnanimous than himself. <laughs> Krishna can do anything. That's Krishna. Yes? In his various avatars, he comes as Ram, he comes as Narasimha, and basically manifests this, the same opulences as Krishna are in Narasimha and Ram, according to Rupa Goswami. It's just that they don't display them. Krishna just displays his complete intimate opulences. Narayan, Vishnu, Varaha, Kurma, so many avatars. Bhagavatam says just like there are waves in the ocean, Krishna manifests so many avatars throughout history. And they are all non-different than him. So someone may ask, how is it that one avatar is um, displaying a higher degree of, of, of love and intimacy than another, if it's the same person? Because the Lord's independent. He could, he could reveal himself less magnanimous, as magnanimous, more magnanimous. That's Krishna. But he's supremely magnanimous in all of them. So if there's supreme, completely full, unlimited mercy, then how could there be this more or less? If something is unlimited, how could something be more than unlimited? For those of you who are logical mathematicians, <laughs> really, try to explain that. How can something be greater than unlimited? Unlimited means no end. For something to be greater than something means it has to, the other thing has to have an end. Krishna is unlimited in all of his forms, in all of his incarnations, and in how he manifests in all of the great religions of the world. How could something be more? Achintya. In other words, it, it's beyond us to understand. But Krishna is so achintya. It's totally beyond our understanding. But yet, we can understand. <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> you can't understand. <laughs> but at the same time, you can understand. <laughs> that is Krishna's Leela. And Krishna explains he's the supreme source of remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Vedaham samatitani varatamanani charjuna. Krishna says, I know everything. I know everything in the past, all that's happening now, all things in the future. I know every living being. He's, he's the sarveshwareshwara. He's the controller of all controllers. But yet, he forgets. Sometimes he forgets. <laughs> this is wonderful. How could the person who knows everything, who's beyond forgetfulness, forget? 
Now, for somebody, they think if this is either something crazy or, or it's an imperfection. How can the Lord, who knows everything, forget? We forget because of ignorance. But Krishna, this is part of his completeness. In order to reciprocate, in, and not only reciprocate, but actually enter into deep loving relationships with his devotees, Krishna by his own will can forget. <laughs> <laughs>